But I want to introduce them now, and we might come back to them um, later on in the semester. All right. Um, if these seem confusing, close your eyes and think pleasant thoughts for the next 10 minutes or so. All right. Because you can do it any of the ways that we did it previously. Um, I just thought that that these these ways are, are in a way even better than than what we did before, and and so I want to show it to you, and I want to talk about why they're better. All right, I, it was almost like as I was doing the one change I made Wednesday, uh, not Wednesday, today's Wednesday. I made Monday um, in lab. The other change um, I just made right now. I thought it would be another good thing to add, and it a little puttering because it's been a while since I did that, and I finally hit on the right code. All right. Let me show you what I did. I actually added a third thermometer to our problem and a second button. <laughs> All right? So, if you put in a temperature and click the second button, and click either of the buttons, but let's click the second button, it shows us three therm thermometers now. So, if you remember, um, the first two thermometers were created in different way, ways. The first thermometer was created by having essentially two divs, a gray div and a red div, and figuring out how wide the, the, the red div needed to be, and then setting the style property to that percentage. The second div, or the second thermometer rather, was accomplished by having a little image, a little red image that was, um, I think, five pixels wide, ten pixels wide, something like that, where one of them represented a degree, and we went and we made uh, that go that many times. You know, we loop through and we use the inner HTML property to write an image tag for each of the degrees. The third way also creates an image for each uh, of the degrees. So the third way is much like the second way. The difference is, is instead of writing directly to the inner HTML, which works, but there possibly can be better ways to do it, we actually create an image object and then add that image object that many times. Let me show you what I mean. So I'll look here and in Notepad. I have a loop just like I had a loop here, all right, and where I set the inner HTML, I loop through and each iteration through the loop I added to my string variable out the code for an HTML tag for either the red or the gray, all right. And when I was done, I set the inner HTML equal to my output. can actually move that after the loop. Probably a better place for it. So, when I'm done, out will contain a string, just a plain old text string, that consists of um, as many HTML image tags as there are images that I want to display. Another way to say it is as many uh, images as there are degrees because one image equals one degree in this example. And then when I'm all done, I pop that string into the inner HTML of thermometer 2. So that's how thermometer 2 was done. Thermometer 3 was done different. All right. What I actually do is I actually create a new image object. All right. So I've created a new image object. Where is it on the page? It isn't. It's just in my code right now. I then go and I check to see if it's going to be a red or a gray object, much like I did up here. And I set the SRC property of that image to either red JPEG or gray JPEG. Because it's an image object, it's just like I was accessing an image that was already on the page. I can refer to that image and say .src. The only difference is I can't say document.getElementById, blah, 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 because it's not on the document yet. It's not on the page. All right? 
Um, so I've created that image object that's sort of floating in space. It's nowhere on the page. I set the source property. I could set other properties as well. I could set the alt property. I could set an ID for it. I could set any number of properties. And then, after I create the image, either with a source of red or a source of gray, I then go and I say to that third thermometer, a pen child. That's a different way to write the object to that. In one case, I'm making the HTML code in a string. In another case, I'm making JavaScript objects and adding them to other JavaScript objects. This, the purist would say this is a better way because I then have objects that I could program with later on. All right? I could then go in and, and, and I have these objects, I could do something else with them later. So this is probably, the purists would say, the better approach. I guess it depends on what you're, what you're doing. But I did want to show this to you. One thing to keep in mind is this class is divided into JavaScript, PHP, and Ajax. But that doesn't mean when we're done with the JavaScript uh, segment that we're not going to talk anymore about JavaScript. Our focus will shift a little bit, but we'll keep adding and keep talking about different pieces of JavaScript functionality. So we might get more on this one later. But the difference is, the difference between these two, in this case we're creating a string that we set the inner HTML to when we're all done. In this case we're creating an image object which we are adding to that thermometer object, which is a div. If that's confusing to you, then disregard the third thermometer in this example. Don't worry about it for now. We'll come back and, and talk about this later, but don't worry about it now. All right. My other little surprise today, the one that I built right before class, involves not using the HTML on attribute to trigger the JavaScript. All right. If you remember, um, I probably said something like, you know, to the degree that you can separate your different technologies, separate your CSS from HTML, separate your JavaScript from that, to the degree that you can separate that out, the better shape that you're going to be. All right? Well, in our example so far, we've had our HTML and JavaScript tangled a little bit. It's not horrible but we've tangled it a little bit. That is, we have had an on-click event, which is a JavaScript statement in the middle of our HTML. Again, what's so bad about that? Well, I'm not saying there's anything bad about it. I'm just saying there's a different way that, like, purist programming folk would love because it allows us to put JavaScript on an HTML element without having an ugly snippet of JavaScript code in the middle of our HTML tag. And what we can do is we can write JavaScript to assign our event handlers to HTML elements. And that's what this little snippet of code does up here. Window.onload equals function. What that's doing is that's creating a snippet of code that's going to run when this page loads. Okay? We're doing it instead of doing this. On load equals. So as soon as the page loads, what am I going to do? I'm going to create for my alt button, I'm going to set its on click event to equal a function that simply calls my calculate function. Which if you notice, this function here's on click event is to call calculate. This fun or, or not this function, but this button's on click event is to call calculate. This, this button has no on click event 
until this code runs. And this code says, find that button, make is on click event equal to a function that calls calculate. And the end result is that both of them end up calling calculate when you click on it. This is slick, all right? If you can, if you can get used to doing it this way, it's a real cool way to do it because what you can do is you can actually automate your applying of event handlers to your HTML code. Let me give you a for instance. For instance, let's say you had an image gallery with dozens of thumbnails, for example. All right? Each thumbnail you might want to treat very similarly. You might want to call some function. Well, you could write JavaScript code to loop through and look for all your thumbnails. Now, we haven't seen how to do that yet. We'll save that one for another day. All right. But we could loop through and look for all your thumbnails and then programmatically add your on click or on mouse over event to it. And what's more, you could put that in an external JavaScript file and, sh and, and share that between many pages. All right. So that really, again, is a further separation all right, and it is, um, you know, adds to the flexibility, maintainability, and so on. Now, I will say, if, you know, if this puzzled you at all, just remember that we talked about this. And remember we talked about a way to not use the on-click event. And, and maybe later on in the semester we'll come back to it, or you can review it, or whatever. So don't get hung up on this if it's, if it's uh, bothering you. Yes? So the on-click is just knowing that it's calling any function that's then specified within this. Okay. Yeah. It's creating a function for it, and that function consists of calling the function calculate. Another way to put this is we're treating its methods like an attribute, and we're setting the attribute dynamically. One little thing I forgot to show you getting to the third thermometer is I, I, I um, appropriated a snippet of code uh, from somewhere. I should have given credit, but if you Google this you can find it to clear out all the children of that thermometer so I can recreate those images each time. So, again, if this part, if, if, if either of these two little snippets confuse you, just put them on the back burner for now and maybe we'll come back to them later. The bigger, more important thing I want you to realize is, again, our JavaScript gets triggered by HTML events. All right? Those HTML events trigger the JavaScript. The JavaScript instructions then uses the DOM to point to different things on the page. All right? And do its thing. And we can set style or other attributes of that by using JavaScript instructions. The main instructions, in fact, you know, we can write, I think it's been shown that we can write any program that we want to write using a mix of assignment statements, which look like this. This equals that is an assignment statement. Loops, which one example is a for loop, and if statements. That really every algorithm you write is going to be a combination of just simple declarative statements that say go and do this. Or statements that repeat a block of code, do this 150 times. Or statements that are conditional that say if this is true, do this, otherwise do that. Every algorithm you write is going to only have those three pieces to it, which is, is kind of cool in a way. You know? So we've studied the three basic statements in JavaScript. Um, what more do we want to study in JavaScript? There's more about the DOM. There's more about the JavaScript programming language. For example, arrays. We can access the DOM for, to do things like loop through and find every image and do something special to every image. All right? But 
probably the most important thing that I want to cover as far as this class goes uh, are functions. All right, Functions are very important. And we've dabbled in functions so far, but we haven't really used functions to their full capability. All right, And that's what we'll spend probably the rest of today on, is talking about functions. Some of those other things, you know, we can get to them later in the semester. All right, But if you don't know functions, then, then there's going to be some difficulty. Okay. Now. Let's start with the definition of function. In this, in this example, we really have one important function, and that's the function calculate. What is a function, and how are they best used effectively? What are they used for? Okay. Function delivers a value. That's true. All right. It can deliver a value. It doesn't have to. All right. So that's definitely part of a function, the fact that there can be a return value associated with it. There can be, effectively, the function gives an answer. All right. Someone tell me something else about a function. That. Exactly. A, a section of code that can be called in different situations, or another way to say that might be from many places. All right. The idea is, is if you have a piece of functionality, you don't want to duplicate the code for it a bunch of times. Yeah, reusability. Right. Reusability and maintainability go together. Right? If, there, if something is done in 10 different places in your website, all right, if the calculation is done 10 different places on your website, if you have 10 pieces of code that accomplishes that, you have a maintenance problem, right? Because if something about that calculation changes, there's 10 places you have to go and change it. Well, what's going to happen? You may forget about one and have inconsistency. You might be you know, you might get to, to the first one at the beginning of the day when you're still sleepy and not do a good job on that. The second one you might do after your second cup of coffee, so it's okay. And the third and fourth one is fine. The fifth one you might get to after lunch, all right, and, and you're feeling tired again, so you don't do a good job. You do fine on the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. The tenth one you're thinking about going home, so you, you fly through it, all right. The point is, is if you do something enough times, all right, you're going to make a mistake. You know, if I were to give you a simple addition problem, you know, the simplest thing in the world, you know, 8 plus 13, you'd probably get it right, you know, even without using a calculator. If I give you 100 of them, I'm guessing somewhat, you know, many of you would probably miss one or two. Not because you don't know how to do it or anything like that, but just the case where you have it, when you have to do something over and over again, you're going to slip up. Right? So therefore the motivation is to put this code so that if something about the code changes, you only have to change it in one place. You don't have to change it multiple times for all the reasons that I cited before. Now in, in this case, let's consider the, the Fahrenheit to centigrade calculation to be, um, to be representative of some business rule within our organization. Maybe it's the calculation of, of a shipping charge, for example. Maybe we ship our goods and, and, and we, you know, we have some formula that determines how, how, to, uh, how to charge for shipping. Um, maybe this is for a school and they have a formula on how to calculate tuition. All right? So when you look at this and you say, well, Fahrenheit to centigrade, that's pretty trivial case. Try to think beyond that to saying, well, this could work for something more complicated as well, and something that was distinct and unique to a particular business. All right? 
really not many businesses make money doing temperature conversions for you, all right? So uh, in that regard, it's not a representative example. Pardon me? The Weather Channel, yeah, exactly. There you go. Uh, but again, we'll consider this to be representative of that sort of thing. So, one term that you'll often hear about functions, all right, is that a good function should work like a black box. A black box is like, I think, originally an electrical engineering term. All right, probably electrical engineering, maybe some other kind, maybe some other uh, engineering discipline. What's a black box? What does that mean when I say a function is like a black box? Backup storage. Backup storage? No, not really. Something that's self-contained. Self self All right. Now, when I say it's a black box, a black box you could diagram like this. In fact, when they show it, like in electrical diagrams, it has known inputs and it has a known output. For example, if you were calculating tuition here at LC, all right, your tuition is based on on what? It's based on your residency status, whether you're an Ohio resident, a county resident, or what. And it's based on how many credit hours you take, right? You give, if, if we were to create a function for that, if we were to give that function those two pieces of input, the residency code and the number of credit hours, it can spit out what your tuition charge is, all right? Um, think of a shipping calculation, you know. I, I don't know the details of FedEx, but I imagine that how much you pay for something depends on where you're sending it, you know, how much your package weighs, and the dimensions of it, and how quick you want it there, all right? So some mix of those four components probably determine how much you're paying for it. So. If we were writing a function for that, the four pieces of input would be the weight, the dimensions, the uh, location that you're sending it to, probably the location you're sending it from, I forgot to mention, and when you want it there. The function does its thing and spits out an answer. Now a function can take multiple inputs, like we described there, you know, the, the date that it's due, uh, the, the location it's from, the location to, the weight, the dimensions. All right. A function, however, only returns one answer. All right. It return a function can return one of something. Let me put it that way. All right. Usually, when we first go over functions, we look at functions that return like a number, or maybe a string, or maybe a boolean. True or false? Is this form valid? All right. True or false? Um, but really, a function can return anything. I could, for example, write code that returned an image object. We would return a single image object if I wanted to. I could have code that did that, that I would give parameters. In this case, maybe I'd pass the temperature into it, and it would return an image object that was either a gray image or a red image. I could write a function to do that, to return an image object. So don't let the, the statement that there is only one output fool you. It's not necessarily one simple value, like an, an integer or a number or a decimal or a Boolean. It can be a complex. It can be an object, all right, which has a bunch of properties associated with it. But there's still only one of them, all right. Whatever it returns of, it's going to return one. That one thing might be real complicated, but it's one complicated thing, all right. One answer, the answer, the result of the function. Now, the black box part of it comes from two things. A well-written function, let me rephrase. A function that's reusable all 
The inside can't see out and the outside can't see in. This is a wall. It's a black box. If you're standing outside the black box, you can't see in to, to, to know what's going on inside of it. Um, if you're standing inside the function, you can't see out to see what's going on around you. Well, what does that mean, right? We don't stand inside functions and look around, all right? What that means is anything from the outside world that the function needs, it gets passed as an argument, all right? So, for example, what we're going to do in a minute here is we're going to write a function that does our Fahrenheit to centigrade calculation, all right? Our Fahrenheit to centigrade calculation should not be able to look out to the page and see that there's a text box called text temp or whatever we called it. Should not be able to look out to the page and see that there is um, a label or a span that's called results or whatever. All right. The function should only know what's inside the function all right, and what gets passed into the function. Now the reverse is true as well. Someone from the outside world should be able to call that function, give it the parameters, and get the results without knowing anything about how that calculation takes place. A good example of that is, is if you've ever used like the square root function in, a, in Excel, right? Do you know how to calculate a square, a square root by hand other than using a calculator or looking on a chart? No. I, don't know. I might have known one time, but I don't know how to do it now. Does that mean, oh, you don't know how to calculate a square root, you can't use a square root function? No. All you need to know to know how to use a function, to be able to use a function, is what it's called, what you give it, and what you're getting back. Those three things are sometimes called the signature of the function. All right? What the function is called, what you give it, and what you're getting back. So if I make a function with that, the nice thing is, is again, if you imagine substituting shipping charge or tuition calculation or something like that for Fahrenheit to centigrade, I should be able to write my Fahrenheit to centigrade calculation, put it in an external file, and document it to say, gee, if anyone needs to call my function, this is what you do. Bring this file into your program and call this function and give it a number and it will give you the answer back. Those of you that did, what lab was it? Lab two with the style sheet switcher. Do you understand how the functions worked in that example? Probably not. I don't think I could necessarily, without sitting down and scratching my head for a while, know everything that was going on in those functions. All right? But you know what? Did that keep you from using it? No, because it was a good function. It was written such that all you had to do was give it something and it did the rest. It was written yeah, the code, the code is very complicated, but it was written such that and it was documented such that this is what you have to do to make this work. All right? And that's sort of a good, good function. So, we could get this solved once and for all and write our centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion and then Anywhere we needed to use that code, we could reuse it. Again, if it was a tuition calculation or shipping calculation or whatever. All right? So, let's go and let's write the function. I'm going to write a function. Oh, it's on. <laughs> I'm going to write a function that says convert f to c because that's what this does. Now, this function will take one argument. What is the argument that's going to take? It's going to take the temperature in Fahrenheit. All right. So I'm going to give sort of a placeholder name to that value. In this case, in this problem, 
that value is coming from a text box. But you know, we could write another web page where we didn't pull the value from a text box, but we pulled the value from a drop down. Maybe there's a little drop down that says, hey, pick the temperature in, center, in Fahrenheit, click this button, and it will do it. In fact, when we're done, we will we'll code that. We'll code a little page to reuse our function to prove that, that what we're doing is good and, and really reusable. All right. So I'm going to call that argf. It's my convention to proceed arguments with ARG. All right. In the case that it's an argument that gets passed in, into it. That way I know that it got passed into this function. You certainly don't have to do that. I've seen a lot of code where it doesn't do that. But that's just my practice to do that. Now, how do I calculate Fahrenheit to centigrade? Well, I'm sort of going to use this formula, right? But, these variables don't exist. Right? There's no TF and TC and all that. So I'm going to use my argument because that is whatever the temperature that gets passed to this, that's what I use in the formula. And I'm going to store that result in a variable. And lastly, I'm going to return it. So, this function, small as it is, all right, is a nice little black box, right? It takes everything it needs in as an argument. There's nothing that it addresses about the page other than what gets passed to it. All right? It does its thing, it does its calculation, and then it broadcasts this. All right? Now, we have to change this to call our function. So we're not going to have this formula. Instead, we're going to say TC equals, what do I call that? Convert F to C, and we pass in TF. So how is this going to work? We still pull the value from the text box. We give it to this function. We call the function and we pass it the value. That value gets plugged into this variable. If there were more than one argument, they'd get plugged in in order. The first thing there would get plugged into the first argument, the second thing into the second argument. This function does its thing, gets the results, returns that value, whatever that function returns gets put in this variable tc. And the rest of this function stays the same. The only difference is, is where the actual calculation took place is now not included as part of this function but was separated out. And now any other function? Now any other, yeah, any other function. Now at this point, we're limited to it, it would have to be on this page, right? So we could have another thing on this page. We can go one step better and say, let, let's make sure it works first of all. Let's make sure it still works. And it does. We can go one step better. We can break this out and put it in an external file, exactly. Then any number of pages could go and use that. And I'll save this as, what do I want to save it as? Um, Calc.js. And I can make my own little library of stuff. All right? In other words, if I'm getting rich doing English to Celsius, to, to, to metric conversions, right? I could have a function to calculate uh, inches to centimeters, um, miles to kilometers, um, pounds to kilograms, whatever. 
All right. We could have a whole suite of code that we would bring in like a library and just bring it in and it would be available on any page that we did it. And we could break it down. You know, maybe there would be temperature-based conversions in one file and length-based conversions in another file and weight-based conversions in a third file. Whatever made sense for us. Now we'd have to go, we have to go and we have to put that into this file. And the way we do it is script lang equals JavaScript src equals the name of it, which <laughs> even though I saved it two seconds before, I forgot. Calc js. All right. And it should work. We did everything right. Oops. <laughs> and it doesn't. Why doesn't it? It can't find calculate. No, I didn't. It's in the same folder. Let's take a quick look. I wonder if the case manners, I would not expect it to, but we'll do that. I wonder if it does not like my shorthand for an ending tag. We'll try that. Wow. Good point. Not very scientific, eh? Let's put it back to this. My guess is it's this one. Although, I'm going to call shenanigans if it's this one. Because that's not right. Yes, it is. All right. Learn something new every day. All right, there we go, and we're back in business. Okay, so we could write, in the interest of time, I won't, but I could write another page that didn't use a text box at all, used a drop down, all right, and, uh, you know, populated uh, and called that function using the value from a drop down, not the value from a text box. Does the function care? No. The function doesn't need to know that it came from a Dropbox or it came from a text box. It doesn't refer to anything on the page. It simply takes the value it's given, does its thing, and returns the results. Now, let me ask you a question. And let me, let, me, let, me re let me word this in a tricky manner. Is our goal to make every function 
good and reusable. Let me rephrase that. Is, it, is our goal to make every function reusable? Okay, why not? What functions would I not care about that are reusable? Exactly. You have essentially, if I can draw a sketch here, you're going to have a couple functions, a couple fu kinds of functions. Here's my page with all the HTML elements. Over here are going to be my business logic functions. And again, we'll consider the centigrade to, or Fahrenheit to centigrade one a calculation. Uh, an example of a business logic function. The code to do the conversions here, the data is here. We said this one to be reusable shouldn't know anything about what's on that page, right? Because if it knows something about on that page, then it's not reusable because it could only work on that page. All right, we couldn't put it on another page then it had a different set of HTML controls. Well, if you, if you carry this through logically, there's going to have to be something that bridges the gap. That sort of serves as a glue between our page and our business logic functions. Or maybe business logic isn't a good, good word. Our reusable black box sort of functions of which business logic would be one. There has to be something to connect that to the page, right? It, they can't literally be separate from the page and have no link whatsoever. So there's going to be some functions that you write that really are only going to serve the purpose of gluing stuff together. All right? And those functions have to know about the stuff that's on the page. All right? And therefore, they're written pretty much with a specific page in mind. All right? So, the stuff that's going to be reusable are, is the stuff that you could see having benefit on multiple different pages. For example, if we determine this was a, a piece of functionality that could be used on many different pages, yes, we would make this into a beautiful little black box reusable function. There might be other things. Maybe we write some validation functions that we could use on every single page. All right? And in fact, we'll do that uh, next time. Uh, we'll write some validation functions that will validate to make sure that the data is correct. And then we can use those functions on every page we need to validate on. We don't have to write custom our validation every time. That should act like a black box, right? Because we're planning on reusing that. But the code that's going to grab the value from the text box and send it to that, it has to know that there's a text box there. So that code it kind of falls into this category of a little glue function that connects our page to the reusable functions. So in that regard, um, not all functions are written with the intent of being reusable. All right? Um, some functions, uh, by their nature, are not going to be reusable because their job is to sort of be a boss function or sort of be a glue function and sort of connect everything together. Um, so we'll continue to see examples of that. Um, you'll continue to see examples to that in, in, uh, in a lot of different cases. Those of you that have taken or are taking CISS 243, all right, Essentially, your event handlers are sort of those glue functions, right? The event handlers connect the page to the other stuff on your page. And really, I guess that's what these event handlers do as well. They connect the page to other sort of functions that may or may not be on the page. I said originally stuff, other stuff on the page, but it could be um, other stuff that's even not on the page. All right, the big thing that we have yet to consider is validation. And what we can do is we can... Uh, try to write some cool validation for this and we can uh, first maybe take a, a brute force method all right, and then we can look to maybe do a better job than our brute force method 
and, and we'll see how that goes. So that's what we will be working on on Monday. I'm going to, uh, over the weekend, plan out sort of the next few classes, and I should have a better idea when the JavaScript uh, quiz is, um, which I believe according to the schedule is next week, but it will not be next week. That I can promise you. Um, whether it is, more than likely it will either be two weeks from today or two weeks from last Monday. So what was last Monday? The 12th? It will probably either be the 26th or the 28th. And, but I'll probably have a better idea um, after I, I look through everything and plan it. All right. See you over in LAM.